that everybody understands the vein in which you set those things. But I would dearly love to hear Brother Michael the next hour and Brother Gene Hill after that and the rest of the speakers today. But uh, I really feel that I need to get back home at this time and I uh, appreciate so much the prayers, the prayer of Brother Smith and others that have been prayed. And I know that some of these have been public, but many others have been and will be in private. And one reason I appreciate them so much is because of what James said, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And I know there are many righteous individuals here that will be praying and that your prayers avail much. And I thank the Lord for that, not only for physical health, but for the work of the Lord and spiritual reasons. Uh, I, want to, I want to say I look forward to being Brother Doug Post, the Lord willing, in October. Uh, he and I and Brother Johnny Oxendine are going to England to preach and teach God's Word over there. And we look forward to that. And it's been good to be with him and all of you faithful brethren here this week. And I'm again thankful to the elders and the congregation here for having me. And I appreciate it so much. And all the hospitality that has been and is extended. Now, Brother Michael uh, asked me to deal with this topic due to the fact that he was going to be taking Brother Brown's topic on the three lessons on the church and prophecy, which I've gained a lot from, and so I agreed to do that. But his material in the book is excellent. I'm going to use some of that. Some of it will be things that I brought in, but um, so hopefully... If, if you want to take a few notes in case there are things that I bring out that he didn't, uh, then certainly that would be good. As I told him this morning, I could have used all of his material, and that would have been very good. I want to begin this morning in Deuteronomy, the 20th chapter, and verse number 8. This is the instruction of Moses to the children of Israel regarding fighting their military battles. And uh, before I read that, though, uh, Brother Michael brought in a good point yesterday from Isaiah chapter 2. Of course, many good points, but in verse number 4, this is a widely misconstrued passage. But as he said, it does teach the peaceable nature of the church and the unity that obtains between those who come into Christ in the church and even some who were bitter enemies before. And the fact that the Lord's church does not fight physical warfare, but spiritual. We know that ancient Israel fought physical battles. But in Isaiah 2 and verse 4, in the prediction of the coming of the house of the Lord, the kingdom of the church, Isaiah said, And he shall judge, that is the Lord, among, many na among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And that, of course, is a reference to carnal warfare or physical military warfare. And we know from what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning at verse number 3, that our warfare in Christ is not of a carnal or a physical nature. And I'd like to read that, verses 3 to 5, and I'm getting to Deuteronomy here in just a moment. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and everything that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. When we fight this warfare, our goal is to bring every thought, and of course, if every thought is brought under obedience to Christ, so will, it, will every action. And in fighting this warfare, it is mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, we're not apostles like Paul. 
But we have that same power in and through the gospel to defeat and pull down the strongholds of Satan. As Paul said in Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But now going to Deuteronomy, the 20th chapter, in verse number 8, this was the instruction of Moses by inspiration of Jehovah God to Israel. And the officers shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. Now this statement is very insightful regarding the influence that we have upon one another, even in the church. Just as courage and enthusiasm and zeal are contagious, so is fear and faint-heartedness. And we know that those who are fearful, that is cowardly, will be in the lake of fire and brimstone, Revelation 21.8. Sadly, I hate to have to say that, but that typifies many in the church today who are fearful and faint-hearted. And this is one reason that we've had so much compromise in the Lord's church. People are afraid for whatever reason, losing their job, losing their position, incurring the enmity of so-called prominent brethren and more concerned about offending them than the Lord himself. But we know it in Galatians 5, 9 that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And so if one of us in the church becomes fearful and faint-hearted, and by fearful, of course, we don't mean fearing God, reverence for God and fear for Him produces courage. But we're talking about cowardice. When people in the church become cowardly and shrink back, which Paul refused to do, Acts 20, verse 27, this rubs off on others. And indeed, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, as Paul said to the Galatians in Galatians 5 and verse number 9. So we see again God's wisdom to ancient Israel in saying, if anybody is fearful or faint hearted, let him go on back home, lest he cause his brethren to be that way. One thing I want to tie in on this, though, is the lectureship in the last few days that rather than encouraging ourselves and brethren to be fearful and faint-hearted, this lectureship has encouraged us to be vigilant and courageous for the faith and for the church of the Lord and to take a stand against error, has it not? Hearing the comments and the many good brethren and these powerful lessons, it is a great encouragement to one another. But friends, we know that we're not always going to be together. When we leave here, we're going to go back home. And there are going to be many people, perhaps somewhere we preach, who are fearful and faint-hearted. And we're going to have to be like Phineas, who rose up with a javelin in his hand, when a heathen woman, an Israelite man, came right in before Israel. God had brought the plague upon them, because the Moabites enticed the Israelite men to commit whoredom with the Moabite women. And so what did this Israelite man do? He came right in while they were weeping, and they were in the very act, as it is implied, of fornication. Because Phinehas thrust the javelin through them both at one time. At one time. And God blessed him for that. Phineas stood up and that stayed the plague from Israel. Now we're going to have to rise up with a javelin as it were. But really not a physical one. But the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Ephesians 6, 17. And to execute God's will against error, sin, worldliness, and ungodliness. As gospel preachers, elders, and as members of the church. We're going to have to be like Phineas and rise up. And the Lord will be with us and he will bless us. We're talking about the militant church. 
We know that Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world, else would my servants fight. John 18, 36, But my kingdom is not from hence. And we know that, again, the warfare is spiritual in nature. But nevertheless, the Lord intends and purposes and wills us to fight diligently for what is right and against evil and against sin. And the Lord will be with us all the way. In Romans 8, 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? That verse gives us a lot of strength. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and 6, let your conversation, that is your manner of life, be without covetousness and be content with what you have, as we are told in the scripture. We are to be content and we are not to lust after material things. We're not to be covetous. Why? Why is this the case? Because he has said, the Lord has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So our conversation in a matter of life is to be without covetousness. The idea here, if my understanding is correct, is why should you want the world and material things when you have the Lord? You have it all. So that we may boldly say, verse 6, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. In verse number 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. You know, friends, the fear of God will cause us not to fear man. Over in Westminster Abbey in London is reported that there's a, tombs, a tomb there with the epitaph, he feared man so little because he feared God so much. In Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. We know that the church is to be militant. According to Webster, this means engaged in warfare or combat. Fighting. There are some, of course, who bemoan this, even the brotherhood. Oh, oh, let's don't fight. Oh, let, let's let's don't be so controversial. Let's let's just keep peace, even peace at the cost of compromise. Is the Lord pleased with that? If we compromise the faith? No, he said that we are to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. The word faith there is the totality of of New Testament teaching with the article the it is to be obeyed Acts 6 7 it is to be preached Galatians 1 23 it is to be continued in Colossians 1 verse 23 several years ago I heard a tape by a brother whom I believe is well beloved of this congregation he's long been gone to the eternity brother George Darling According to Brother Darling in this lesson, he said, With some, brethren, it's like cream puffs at 20 paces. Now, you know, that was a good statement. That's always stuck with me. Cream puffs at 20 paces. They don't want to get down in the trenches and fight for the truth and stand up for what's right. But now, beloved friends, the church of the Lord is indeed the army of Jesus Christ. A good soldier will wear the right uniform. And of course, what we are to wear is Jesus Christ. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Romans 13, 14. This wearing of Christ begins when we obey the gospel of Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Galatians 3, verse 20. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Verse 27, I heard this story several years ago. Uh, I heard this in a, a tent meeting, and this preacher told the story about a man who lived just south of the Mason-Dixon line when the Civil War, War of Northern Aggression, broke out. He loved the North, but he lived in the South. So he thought he would remedy the problem this way. He put on a gray shirt and blue pants. And the story goes that the North shot him in the shirt 
in the south shot him in the pants. Now, I don't know how true that is, but it's a lot of truth in the illustration. And that is when we compromise and try to ride the fence and play on both sides, then we'll be destroyed. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, Matthew 6, 24. And he that is not with me is against me, Matthew 12 and verse number 30. Yes, when we come into Christ and his glorious body, the church, of which Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, Matthew 16, 18. And of which Paul said, there is one body, Ephesians 4, verse 4. Then we come into the army of the Lord. We come into the militant church as God wills it to be. Now I'd like to turn at this time to the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verse number 18. Here Paul commands the young preacher Timothy to make war. 1 Timothy 1, 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Now the idea here of the charge is a mandate, a command. This is a mandate from the captain of our salvation, Jesus Christ, Hebrews 2.10. It's a mandate, it is a command to each and every soldier of the Lord. Now, Paul spoke to Timothy again in the vein of being a soldier. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. But in the first verse he said, Thou therefore my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You mean to tell me that being a good soldier of the Lord is part of God's grace? Well, according to some, well, that's surely not the case. It's just grace and love and good feeling and that's it. Doesn't have anything at all to being a soldier. But indeed, friends, because of the grace of the Lord, we are to be soldiers of the Lord and we are to endure hardship and hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Another thing here in this passage is that in being a good soldier, we're not to get caught up in worldly entanglements. And that's what happens to so many preachers, elders, and members of the church. They get entangled in the world. They get caught up in earthly things, worldly things. And maybe not necessarily things of the world that are intrinsically evil or sinful, but they just get so caught up in earthly matters. And of course, some do get caught up in worldly entanglements that are sinful. But we can get so ensnared in things of an earthly nature, earthly activities that do not pertain to the work of the Lord and the work of the church, for example, some get so consumed in sports and recreation and ball playing and other things that they do not have time, let alone energy, for fighting the battles of the Lord. But Paul informs Timothy that if you're going to be a good soldier, if you're going to war, if you're going to please him who has chosen you to be a soldier, you cannot afford to be entangled in the affairs of this life. But now another scripture 1 Timothy 6, verse number 12. Paul said to Timothy again, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Then in the second epistle to Timothy, Paul declares toward the end of his life, right before the axe came down on him, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Oh, beloved, if we can just be able to say sincerely, earnestly, and honestly at the end of our lives, I have fought a good fight. And there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. That's what the Lord has laid up for a faithful soldier in his army, the church. 
Now, there's a song that we're very familiar with. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner. It must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Yes, that describes the conflict that we're in. The Lord leads his army, the church. And we know that it is a victory that is in store if we stay faithful to Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in Revelation 17, in verse number 14, we know that those who are with Christ will be victorious. Here John writes, These shall make war with the Lamb. That is, the enemies of the Lord will make war with Him. <coughs> Excuse me. And the Lamb shall overcome them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Those who are with Him are the church of Christ, and every faithful member thereof. We read of faithful saints in Revelation 14, verse 4. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Friends, if we're going to follow the Lamb wherever he leads, we're going to be led into the field of battle. We are going to be led into controversy. We're going to be led in this spiritual warfare of which we speak. In order for the Lord's church to be strong and militant, preachers, elders, leaders must give a certain sound of the trumpet. Paul uses that figure in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 8. I believe that's very appropriate for our study this morning. Paul said there in 1 Corinthians 14, in verse number 8, for if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? We know in those days they use the trumpet to signal many things. And a certain sound was for a certain action. One sound might be to go forward. Another sound might be to retreat. But depending on the sound of the trumpet, the military would act. Sadly today, my friends, I'm afraid that the only sound some brethren are giving is that of retreat and compromise and balance, perhaps. But if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? But we must follow and hearken to the commands of our commander-in-chief, the captain of our salvation, Jesus Christ. Now, he is our leader he is our leader. You know, in reading history regarding George Washington, General George Washington at Valley Forge and in other uh, conflicts that he was involved in, later, of course, he became our first president of the United States, George Washington braved many of the ills and hardships with his soldiers. And that's commendable. But, of course, not nearly to the degree that our Lord did. Our Lord has suffered many things for us and gone through these battles. Our Lord is a great example as our commander and chief. I'd like to go back to the book of Isaiah, the 59th chapter. And we've talked a lot about prophecy last night and during Brother Michael's lectures on prophecy, the church and prophecy. This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ in Isaiah 59, verse 17. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head, and he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. That describes our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And certainly we also are to put on such armor. As we go to the book of Ephesians, the sixth chapter, beginning in verse 10, Paul said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles, that is, the trickery, the wiliness of the devil, his deceits, 
and his machinations and his schemes. Put on the whole armor of God. And of course, we must put on all of it, not just part of it. Some have the idea we can just put on part of it and go into battle. But in so doing, we're asking to be destroyed. We must put on the whole armor of God. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Again, it's not carnal warfare. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Beloved brethren in Christ, we are fighting things that we cannot even see. And powers that are exceedingly great. There are things behind the enmity that we face that we don't even know of. But we know one thing who is behind them all. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5, 8. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. That's the problem with, it, with many. They do not want to stand. And of course, the Roman soldier, he had on these special shoes, perhaps resembling football cleats, and resembling, I don't mean exactly like them, in which he would have to stand his ground. And of course, if he didn't do that, that was defeat. Sadly, today, there are many who are not standing their ground. They're not standing for the Lord and His truth. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all that is over all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. You know, in studying the battle of 1854, between the Russians and what were called the Allies, the British, the French, and the Turks. And some think of this as the Battle of Sevastopol, but I think technically it was called the Battle of Balaclava. Of course, there were other battles at Sevastopol as invaders from the south would want to come up into what we know as the Ukraine or Russia to invade Eastern Europe. But, and of course, I labored in Sevastopol for a while, preaching the gospel. And I tried those hills around Balaclava on various occasions. And this is where the Allies were encamped in order to besiege Sevastopol. And uh, it was said that the general, the British general in charge of the troops, hesitated. And for months and months, things went on when they could have gone on and taken the battle. And people died. And it's believed there were losses because of this hesitation. This reminds us of many in the church. They want to hesitate in confronting error and things that are sinful. But we're just giving the devil a stronger and greater grip when we hesitate in standing up for what is right. Another thing in this battle was a blunder that was committed, and that is when the 600 went into what was called the Valley of Death. And they went in, there was a blunder. But we don't, they went in Without guns, but the enemies, all they had guns, and hundreds of them were killed. But there's one line in that poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson, The Charge of the Light Brigade, where he says, It's not theirs to question why. It's theirs but to do or die. Now our commander, our captain, never blunders. And it's important also to understand his orders and the will of the Lord, Ephesians 5, 17. Or this will mean death. But our captain will never blunder. And it's not ours 
to question why it is but ours to do or die. I'd like to think about something with you. How shall we be strong and victorious here briefly? Imagine a young officer coming out of West Point to be a commissioned officer in the military who declares, well, I only want to plan strategy, give orders, wear a commissioned officer's uniform, live in the officer's quarters, and associate with high-ranking officials. I do not want to live or even be near the battlefield. I do not want to get into the fray. Does that remind you of any preachers today? They want a cushy position. They want to be professional preachers. They want to be polished. Uh oh. Yes, polished. And just get along to go along. Keep their position. They do not want to enter into the fray. A good salary. They don't want to engage in conflict and pick their battles. Be sure if you stand against something that you've got the majority of the brotherhood behind you that you don't dare stand against a school or a congregation or a preacher or anyone else that's prominent and has a lot of power and influence. Don't do that, whatever you do. Another thing about these kind of preachers is that they want to keep, to stay away from the hot spots. You know, an officer like this would want to keep away from the conflict. What about Normandy and D-Day, which we hopefully have just honored, and the valiant troops that went on to the shores of France? Did they pick a location along the shoreline where there was not going to be much conflict? What about some school paper, uh, Brotherhood papers today? And some schools? Oh, you know, we're, we're, going, we're going to get on Lipscomb and Pepperdine and Abilene, and well, we should, but we're not going to touch Dave Miller, top side or bottom. We're not going to touch Apologetic Pre Apologetics Press. We're not going to touch Memphis School of Preaching. We're going to address Ruby Shelley and instrumental music, and again, we need to do that, but we dare not leave these hot spots that are invading congregations that at least formerly were sound. You see, are we avoiding the hot spots of the battle? Some are. They're picking the battles that are more popular. Paul did not shrink back from declaring the whole counsel of God. Acts 20, verse 27. And neither should we. We dare not shrink back in the battle of the Lord. We have the most powerful weapon to deface, defeat Satan and everything that he may bring against us. We must deal with all of his cohorts and all the forces that he brings against God and against what is good and right. False doctrine, immorality, perversions, worldliness, worldly philosophies, Colossians 2, verse 8, all kinds of darkness and evil. We read of our leader, Jesus Christ, our King. And by the way, Jesus Christ is not like King Saul there in the Valley of Elah in 1 Samuel 17 when the giant of Gath came up and defied the armies of Israel. King Saul was willing to let, to let a young shepherd boy, David, go into battle against Goliath. Christ is a king, though like King Saul, but of course, a greater king, king of kings. But not only was Christ king, he was a warrior. You remember David in 2 Samuel chapter 11? He was king. He was a great warrior, David was. You remember he stayed home, though, during that battle, and he wandered out upon the housetop. He looked with lust upon Bathsheba committed adultery, committed cover-up and murder and other ungodly things. He stayed at home during the battle. 
We have a king and a warrior in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Friends, as our king, our captain, and our leader, he does not want us to stay home from the battle. He wants us to go out and confront and make war. Now, I want to bring this in briefly before we close this morning. Uh, in Revelation chapter number 11, if you have your Bibles, we might see a point here that we haven't thought about. Maybe we have, maybe we've used it. But we read of the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth, verse 4. And we read how that they were killed. And the people and kindreds of tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they, shall, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry. Verse number 10. And the end of the verse, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Now how did they torment the people of the earth? That's not talking about God, godly people who love the truth and want to serve God. By the word, they tormented ungodly people and worldly people. I wonder today, are we making war? Christ didn't sit back and let the war come to him. He went out and he made war against evil. Are we tormenting those in sin? I don't mean that we're trying to hurt them in any way, intentionally or maliciously. But by a godly life and by faithful preaching and teaching and signing for the truth, we are tormenting those who are bent on doing evil. We are to torment them. We're not to comfort them like some preachers do. We're not to comfort them by saying things that will tickle their ears, as Paul spoke of those in 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. We're not to comfort those in sin. That's what many preachers and congregations are doing today. They are comforting people in adultery and people in compromise and liberalism and false doctrine. They're, oh, well, I, I came away. I felt so good after hearing that sermon. I just felt so good when I went to dinner Sunday. Oh, I know I might need to repent about a few things, but I still felt good after hearing that. You know, are we feeling people good on the road to hell? Is that what we're doing? Now, I'm going to close here in Revelation 19. I'm just going to read this and sit down. Revelation 19, beginning at verse 11. <clears throat> John said, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, that's Jesus Christ, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And we know that Christ shed his precious blood for us, 1 Peter 1, 19. But this we understand to be the blood of his enemies, right here. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, white symbolizing victory here, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4, Even the famous Roman sword that executed so many people. God's Word is sharper than that. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Thank you. We appreciate that, Brother Danny. And there was a preacher years back that was brought in to 
teach congregations how to grow their church, their congregation. And they had a gathering of all of the preachers in the area. I was there, and one of the points that he made was you never let people leave feeling bad. Well, you know, sometimes they need to. If they're in sin, they need to feel bad. They need to feel guilty so that they will repent. You're talking about uh, fighting some of these battles that uh, with uh, MSOP, Apologetics Press, and things. You just forgot, Brother Danny, that some institutions are just too important to lose. As Jerry said, sacred cows. Some of them have become such. Too big to fail was another term that was used. Um, they have, the sad thing is, they become more important to people than the Church of Our Lord. We'll end with that, and uh, in about nine minutes we need to.